I'd like to pray with you one more time, if that, that would be okay. Let's pray. Father, all the things that we pastors want to see happen, we can't make happen. And so I pray now for your power and your presence here, that through me, at this moment, as you have through song, go to places where I can't go and do things to exalt Christ and to subdue sin and to preserve your saints that I can't do. These are supernatural things and you have chosen to accomplish them through natural agents and it is a mystery and we marvel. So we turn away from all reliance upon ourselves and we Look away to Christ who loved us and gave himself for us and ask for the fullness of the Holy Spirit to speak and to listen. That you might accomplish things and let there be a ripple effect out from here beyond all our imaginations as these nine messages roll up into a great bundle of power. So come and do that, we pray, in ways that I can't imagine and that you've planned from eternity for the good of this people, for the glory of your name, for the nations and the neighborhoods and the churches. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This message has two parts. And while I'm telling you what they are, why don't you turn to the book of Jude, second from the last book of the Bible. It has two parts. In the first part, I will try to draw you in to my amazement that I am still a Christian. And perhaps you will be amazed that you are one still. That I still love the ministry, that I still love my wife. I am amazed. That's the first part. I want to draw you into that amazement. And the second part is... I would like to draw you into an analysis of how that came about based on the book of Jude and the last two verses in particular, two of the most familiar verses in the Bible. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to him who is the only God, the Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, and majesty, and dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forevermore. Amen. So that's going to be the focus of the message. And you can hear in the first sentence, now unto him who is able to keep you where I'm going. So part one, I want to draw you in to my amazement that I am still a Christian, still love the ministry of God's word, still love my spiritual calling as a husband and a father. I complete 60 years this year of being a Christian. I'm 66. I complete this year 32 years of being a pastor at Bethlehem. I finished 44 years of marriage to Noel this year and 40 years of being a father. And these are momentous days for me because we are about to put in place my successor at Bethlehem so that this will be my last time at T4G as a pastor. And so it feels big and very significant to me. When I think about finishing these laps in my race, I am simply amazed that I have lasted. Lasted as a Christian, lasted as a pastor, lasted as a husband, lasted as a father. Now I want to try to help you grasp both experientially from my life as well as biblically why I'm amazed and draw you in. And maybe a first step in drawing you in would be to read an excerpt from my journal 
from 1986. Um, I was 40 years old when I wrote this. I had been at the church for six years, and the reason I read it is because it's not untypical. That is, it is reflective of an emotional vulnerability that I have lived with as far back as I can remember. And you'll hear it. So I'm reading it word for word as I wrote it. Um, when my oldest son was 14, and the next was 11, and the next was 7, and the next was 3, and I was 40 and had been at the church six years. Here we go. This will take about three minutes, three or four minutes. Am I under attack by Satan to abandon my post at Bethlehem? Or is this the stirring of God to cause me to consider another ministry? Or is this God's way of answering so many prayers recently that we must go a different way at Bethlehem than building? I simply loathe the thought of leading the church through a building program. For two years, I have met for hundreds of hours on committees. I have never written a poem about it. It is a deadening thing to my soul. I'm a thinker, a writer, a preacher, a poet, a songwriter. At least these things are the avenues of love and service where my heart flourishes. Can I be the pastor of a church moving through a building program? Yes, by dint of massive willpower and some clear indications from God that this is the path of greatest joy in Him long term. But now I feel very much without those indications. The last two years, the Long Range Planning Committee was started in August 1984, have left me feeling very empty. The church is looking for a vision for the future, and I do not have it. The one vision that the staff zeroed in on during our retreat Monday and Tuesday of this week, namely building a sanctuary, is so unattractive to me today, I do not see how I could provide the leadership and inspiration for it. Does this mean that my time at Bethlehem is over? Does it mean that there is a radical alternative unforeseen? Does it mean that I am simply in the pits today and unable to feel the beauty and power and joy and fruitfulness of an expanded facility and ministry? Oh Lord, have mercy on me. I am so discouraged. I am so blank. I feel like there are opponents on every hand. Even when I know that most of my people are for me, I'm so blind to the future of the church. Oh, Father, am I blind because it is not my future? Perhaps I shall not even live out the year. <laughs> and you are sparing the church the added burden of a future I had made and could not complete. I do not doubt for a moment your goodness and power or omnipotence in my life or in the life of the church. I confess that the problem is mine, the weakness is in me, the blindness is in my eyes, the sin, oh, reveal to me my hidden faults, is mine and mine the blame. Have mercy, Father, have mercy on me. I must preach on Sunday and I can scarcely lift my head. That was 26 years ago, same church. We built that building, and another one, and another one. I hated it every time. <laughs> um, there were worse days, way worse days. Days when the marriage was under attack, Days when the soul was under attack, the soul feeling so numb, I feared for my faith. So, looking back, I'm amazed. <laughs> I'm amazed that I'm 
a Christian today. And I'm, I'm about to finish my course at Bethlehem. I'm simply amazed. How did that happen? That's point two, but we're still on, we're still on the amazement piece. If my faith in Jesus and my eagerness to know him and his word and my thrill at preaching and my love for the church and my fitness for ministry and fitness for heaven and my sexual continence and my spiritual marriage commitment, if any of that were decisively dependent on me, I would have ceased to be a Christian long ago. I would have ceased to care about the Word of God. I would have ceased to thrill at exposition. I would have given up on the church, ceased to be fit for ministry or heaven, and I would have abandoned myself to sexual indulgence and ceased to be married to Noel. I have no doubt about that at all. If the decisive cause for my faithfulness to Christ in any of those expressions must come from me, it will not come because it isn't there. Therefore, I am amazed that I am still a Christian and still love the ministry. And I feel some sense of, of wonder that I think might get close to what Jude felt when perhaps he personalized it and said, now unto him who is able to keep me and to present me blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, my Savior, through Jesus Christ, my Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time, now and, and forever. I think he was amazed when he wrote that. I think he was amazed at the keeping of God. That, that's what it took to keep me. I mean, we're going to unpack this. Did you hear what it took? It took glory and majesty and power and authority beginning to work before the creation was, working every moment of my now and working forever to keep me a Christian. That's what it took. To keep me in the ministry. This is the way doxologies work. First, they say something about God, some action that he's done or promises to do, and then they ascribe attributes to God which account for those actions or come to expression in those actions. So I might say, for example, now to him, who fashion the intricacies of the human eye and every molecule and atom in it. To him belong infinite and inscrutable wisdom and skill. You see how it works? The attributes that you ascribe to him account for the thing you're excited about. Look at this eye. Look at these molecules and these atoms. Look at the way this works. Unto him be wisdom, skill. That's the way they work. Or, for example, now unto him who adopts dirty, abandoned, rebellious children into his family, to him belong compassion and boundless mercy. You see how it works? You ascribe attributes to God in a doxology which account for the thing you're saying you're so excited about. He adopts dirty foundlings into his glorious family. To him be Long compassion. That's the way they work. So, the attributes come to expression in the actions that you are so amazed at. 
So let's read it again. Now unto him who, here's his action, there's three of them, is able to keep you from stumbling or falling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. That's what he's done and is doing. What are the attributes? Now unto the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, be majesty for that, and dominion for that, and authority for that, and power for that, before all time, now, and forever. Jude is amazed at what it takes to keep you a Christian. There are three things he's celebrating, right? God keeps us from stumbling, falling. He presents us before the glory of God, blameless. And he presents us before the glory of God, really, really, really happy. Great joy. Those three things he's done. What came to expression in that what accounts for that is an only God, a Savior, through Jesus, is glorious and majestic and powerful and authoritative before eternity working on it, working on it every minute, working on it forever. That's what comes to expression in my being a Christian 60 years later. He's really amazed at what it takes to keep us Christian, to keep us saved. Do, let's, let's work on the amazement of this just a little longer. Do you have any idea the degree of divine glory, the degree of majesty and power and authority it took to get you alive and keep you alive till this moment and to the day you see Christ. Do you have any idea about the degree, the me How would you talk about the measurement of the glory, the measurement of the majesty and the measurement of the power or dominion, kratos, the measurement of the authority. How would you talk about that? It, it sounds big. How big? That's the sort of thing that keeps me awake. Do we know the degree of glory and majesty and power and authority that it took? No, we don't. We don't. We have no terms of measuring such things. How do you quantify, now here, choose a word, the power or the force or what of a eternal spirit with no hands and no feet and no physical dimensions at all moving into being a created spirit and then continually Keeping that spirit alive. What, what is that? How do, you, what is, what, how, how do you measure that? How strong does this have to be to make that happen? And to keep that going forever? Is it like pounds of pressure? Is it like kilowatts of electricity? Is it like rentgens of radiation? What is that? It's this glory and majesty and power and authority are keeping that in being. How do you measure this to, to get to where Jude seems to be in amazement? God creates spiritual life when we're dead. We know that. At that which is born of the Spirit is spirit, John 3, 6. Once I had no spiritual life, then God the Spirit acted, and my spirit came into being. 
or spiritual life came into being. I am spirit, little s. That which is born of the big S spirit is a little s spirit, and this is not like a demon. The demons are spirits. This is not like that. This is another meaning of the word spirit. This is holy spirit. This is God animated, God sanctified, God inhabited, God sustained, God imparting himself spirit, little s. And God made that by the action of the spirit called new birth. He brought that into being. It's not the kind of life, the life, if you're a Christian, the life you have that came into being by that force, that power, whatever that is of a spirit acting on a nothing and then acting on a spirit to create a spirit and sustain a spirit, that life isn't the kind of life that you would have if he left. If the Holy Spirit left you totally, and if you disunited from Christ, no union with Christ, you wouldn't be a Christian. There would be no life. Therefore, the life we're talking about that we have, this, this being a Christian, is having the Holy Spirit and being united to Christ, which are interwoven terms, right? I am united to Christ by the Spirit. Having the Spirit and having Christ and being in the vine are all one thing, and my life is in Him. He is my life. If He's not there, I have no life. There's no autonomous life in me. So He creates that, and only He can, and then for 60 years, having begun before eternity and having been at work every millisecond of my life and pledging himself to work till the end, made me a Christian, keeps me a Christian, and will keep me forever. And if he doesn't keep it up, I won't be. The giving of this life and the moment-by-moment -moment sustaining of this life and the stirring up of this life to treasure holiness and ministry is a work of God, which is why I said at the beginning, if the decisive cause of my faithfulness to Christ, to ministry, to my wife, my children, must come from me, it will not come because it is not there. It is not in me as mind, as autonomous, as independent. It is there because Christ created it by coming and being the animating principle of it. I bring nothing decisive to my creation. And I bring nothing decisive to the ongoing existence of the divine spiritual life in me. I exist as a Christian by it. I didn't create it, and I don't keep it in being. No more than the universe created itself nor is it kept in being by its own power. It is upheld by Christ. Now Jude is clearly amazed at this, at what it takes to sustain God-created spiritual life, to keep it from collapsing into nothingness, and to bring it to glory, blameless and happy, and he must sense what it takes. And it must be very great. So, how are you going to measure that so that you can join him in the amazement? How are you going to know that this glory and majesty and dominion 
and authority are, are big. And I can only think of two ways that you can measure what it took for God to bring you into being as a Christian and keep you in being moment by moment. Two ways. One is to think about the fact that creating and sustaining spiritual life is something we cannot do, but God alone does. The difference between nothing that I bring to that creation and sustaining of creation and his action is infinite. The difference between nothing and something is an infinite difference. Let me put it this way. If God says to you, create a being, Piper, create a being with divine spiritual life and sustain it, and you will say, I will say, I can't. That will be right. You absolutely can't. And he does it with a word. And the difference between my absolute inability and his absolute ability is big. It's infinite. It is immeasurably great. That's the first way that we can measure what it took to give us life and to preserve our life blameless and joyful before God at the day of Christ. We can't do it. He can do it. The measurement of what it took for us to come into being and be kept in being is the difference between us and God. And that's an infinite difference. And therefore your amazement should be off the charts that you're a Christian. Still. That's the first way. Second way to measure this is if, if all that just sounded confusing and you can't do that computation, like, is there really an infinite difference between nothing and something? Anything? Then just read it in the text. Namely verse 25. What did it take to keep you a Christian? What does it take? It takes glory and majesty and power and authority. And I assume he chooses words like that because he tends for us to realize it takes just about everything he's got to do this. Any amount of divine glory, any amount of divine majesty or power or authority is infinitely greater than what you bring to this equation. So in those two ways, though we can't measure the kind of force, we don't call this kilowatts or pounds or wrenches, a, a, a divine spirit pushing and upholding a created spirit in being. We have no idea how to conceive that action. This text is saying it takes glory and majesty and power and authority from beginning to end to hold you in being as a Christian. You should be absolutely stunned that you are still a Christian. That's the end of part one. Part two. I want to draw you into an analysis of how that happens. Not just an amazement that it happens, which is big enough, but an analysis now from the text of how God did that. How does God keep me from making shipwreck of my Christian life? How does he keep me when Paul's strategies of not losing heart in 2 Corinthians 4 seem remote? How does he keep me when the language to articulate the gospel with words one more time won't come? How does he keep me when I'm not depressed 
because there are false converts in my church, but I fear that I may be one. How does he keep me when I can't remember, I can remember countless times when I have given no evidence at all that I trust the power of God to save a neighbor, let alone a terrorist. How does he keep me when spirit-empowered, gospel-driven, faith-fueled effort is, feels as likely as flying with my arms flapping? How does he keep me when the fuel tank of death-defying devotion to world missions is, seems, empty? How does he keep me when he holds out a treasure to me that I want almost as much as anything and says, you can't have it? How does he keep me when the crown jewel of the new Jerusalem that I'm trying to lead called Bethlehem is cut in slivers by a propeller or by the seduction of the prophetess Jezebel. How does he do it? How does he keep me alive? How does he keep you alive? Believing, serving, married, fathering, All right, here we go. Notice that the book of Jude begins, verse 1, and ends, 24 and 25, with a strong statement of assurance that God is decisively our keeper. We've seen it in verse 24. Now unto him who is able to keep you. And I, I let me, little princess here. I don't think the word able there is intended to signify he's able, but he might not. I think, I mean, I think do, this version of dunamis, I think this is, he is mighty to do this. Now unto him who is mighty to keep you. That's the feel, I think, of this text. Not, he's able, but don't count on it. Verse 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James to all those who are, now three things, three massive things, called, loved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ or by Jesus Christ. Won't affect my exegesis because it's a divine keeping either way. Called, loved in God the Father, and kept. We are called, we are loved, we are kept. The love of God moves him to call his elect and those whom he calls, he keeps. This is, this is the teaching of the Apostle Paul and here the teaching of Jude. When a person is called, they are kept. None is lost. A couple of verses, 1 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. He will sustain you to the end. This is Paul now, not Jude, same teaching. He will sustain you to the end, guiltless. It's like they read each other. I mean, this is common truth in the early church. He will sustain you to the end, guiltless, in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called. Meaning, if he called you, it's done. You will be kept. This is what it means to have a faithful God. Or as you know, you know the next text I'm going to quote, don't you? Romans 8. Those of me predestined, he called. And those of me called, he justified. And those of me justified, he glorified. It's done in the mind of God. Foreknown, predestined, called, justified, glorified, no dropouts. There's an absolute certainty in the heart and mind of God in his faithfulness between being called and being kept. That's what's here. 
So that, that's, the, that's the framework of the book, right? Verse 1 and verses 24 and 25. This is a book about being kept by divine, omnipotent, faithful power. So that's, the, that's really important to see the way he has set it up. Now, between those sandwiched in there, he wanted to go one direction and celebrate salvation, and he says that he must address some false teachers, so he does that, and he warns us in verse 4 that there's a kind of Christian who pervert, you see that, pervert the grace of our, of our God into sensuality. They think they're saved. They're in the church. They're not saved. Verse 5, they are like those who were brought, saved out of Egypt and then were destroyed because they don't believe. Verse 5, they don't believe. So they're professing Christians and they're not called and they're not kept. And the evidence that they're not called and they're not kept is that they crave physical sensations called sensuality. They don't crave Christ. That's the evidence that they're not called. They don't prize the God of grace. They prostitute the grace of God. That's the difference between a Christian in the church who's not called and not kept and those who are. People who are real prize the God of grace. They don't just use the grace of God to get what they want, not God, and thus become prostitutes of the grace of God. So he's warning them about this people, this kind of error. Then, after all these warnings, Jude tells us what we must do do and what we should do not only for ourselves verses 20 20 and 21 in order to be kept but what we must do for others 22 and 23 for them to be kept and I'm not going to talk about that at all Eternal security is a community project, and it would be good for you to preach on verses 22 and 23 about how the keeping commitment of God to his own is worked out horizontally in the community of faith as you pluck people out of the fire and show mercy when they're doubting and other things. That's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about verse 20 and 21 because the paradox of the Christian life is more visible there than in the other, and I want to underline Kevin DeYoung's message because it's here and everywhere. So verse 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, they, they were killed because they didn't believe. So take faith and grow in it. Build in it. Do what you have to do so that block on block is here and you're bigger in faith tomorrow than you were today. Do that. Do that. Building yourselves up on your most holy faith. And second, praying in by, guided by, animated by, sustained by, helped by, carried along by the Holy Spirit, verse 21 now, keep yourselves in the love of God. Whoa. Keep yourselves. There goes, there goes your message. Or not. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So now, Kevin DeYoung's message, 
comes into focus again, as it does all over the Bible. I worked harder than any of them. Nevertheless, it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, his lead text. Or, as Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, because God is the one who is at work in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. Or as Jude says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Verse 21, because God keeps you in the love of God. This is the Christian life. This is the mystery of not only sanctification, but preservation. Verse 1, the order and the logic in this book is very important, supremely important. The love of God called you, and the love of God will keep you. Therefore, keep yourselves in the love. Keep yourself in God's commitment to keep you. What does that mean? Keep yourselves in the love of God. That's that's the main verb in these two verses, and there are three other verbs, and they are participles, which I think Jude means for us to construe as explaining the main verb. So keep yourselves in the love of God, main, main verb. Three ways. One, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. Two, praying in the Holy Spirit. Three, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So I think there are three main words there, and they are faith, prayer, and waiting. The reason I say faith is the main verb or the main word in that phrase rather than building is because you have to say building what? Building yourselves up in the faith. What does that mean? It means getting stronger in faith. Building, you're building faith into your life. Do that. Get stronger in faith. Believe more. Trust more. Rely more. Be more dependent on God's keeping and the other one is prayer praying in the Holy Spirit and the other one is okay you've prayed for help you've trusted it will come and you wait it will come it will keep you keep yourselves in the omnipotent commitment of God's love to keep you. God has committed himself to keep you. Keep yourself in his commitment to keep you. Trust, that is, trust his commitment to keep you. Pray for the daily application of that promise to every detail of your life. And then, Wait patiently for God. Life won't always go the way you hoped. This is so simple. (laughs) I suppose in my little prayer nook in my study, where I have a little prayer bench that I built in 1975, and I suppose as I've bent over that bench thousands of times, the most common prayer has been, lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. Keep me. Keep me. I feel so utterly unable to do the next thing. My kids are at the breakfast table. I have nothing. I, 
I'm supposed to model a, a, a joyful fatherhood. I'm so depressed, I can hardly remember their names. Help me. I guess the most common prayer, pray, praying. I think that's, you know what's happening there? God is keeping me. By moving me, it says, pray by the Holy Spirit. Not by yourself, by your own energies. If you're crying out, Abba, help. The Holy Spirit is witnessing with your spirit. You're the child of God. And you're being kept by having the means of God's keeping you provided by God. From him and through him and to him, I am so thankful, are all things. The psalm that maybe I pray this with most often, preserve me, O oh God, for in you I take refuge. Pray, believe, pray, believe, pray, believe. Preserve me, O oh God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the noble in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows, their libations of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. Even if I can't even move, I won't let him go. Oh, don't let me go. Don't let me let you go. That's how it works. And here I am, amazed. <laughs> amazed. I mean, how many days in this weird emotional cauldron called me, how many days there have been when it felt, I cannot do it. I can't go on. I can't, I can't go to the meeting. I can't preach the sermon. I can't meet my family. I have no idea when the preparation's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to do. And here I am. I mean, I look back and say, how did that happen? How did that happen? God, now unto him, And my praying and trusting doesn't rob him of any of his glory and majesty and power and authority which are decisively effective in my keeping because it says pray by the Spirit. And if we asked him, I'm sure he would agree with Paul, how about faith? Is that also by the Spirit? He would say, your faith is a gift, not your own doing. Not a work, lest anybody should boast. That's what I thought you'd say. My, my praying is a gift. My faith is a gift. Which means my doing these two things that you said are the two things along with waiting that I do to keep myself in the love of God are being affected by the keeping of God. I keep myself by being kept. God keeps me by enabling me to do self-keeping things. And I must do them. That's what Kevin was trying to get at. I must do these things. And sometimes they take effort. But you say in that effort, it's of you. I couldn't, I couldn't even be here bent over if it weren't for you. I would have zero interest in crying out, preserve me, oh God, if you weren't alive in me. There's a way to do effort by faith. The glory you notice this? The glory and the majesty, the first two, I think consist very much in the power and the authority of God to keep you that way. If you say, what's glorious and what's magisterial about God's keeping by enabling me to pray and trust so that I keep myself in the in the love of God. What, what's glorious and magisterial about that? And his answer would be power and authority. 
He's able to do that, and he has the right to do that for you. It doesn't matter whether you understand how God works to make your will comply to his predestined plan for your preservation. You don't need to figure that out in your head and get it all sorted out. What you need is to say he's got the power, he's got the authority, authority and the right to do it. He does it and that's glorious. That's majestic that I'm saved and still saved 60 years after this kind of belly aching, after this kind of wallowing in self-pity, after this kind of blindness to obvious truth. <laughs> I love to ask people, and I'll ask you, what makes you think you're going to wake up a Christian tomorrow? And I hope you give this answer. Now unto him who is powerful to keep me. That's why I'll wake up tomorrow. I'm called and he will keep me. He will wake me up a Christian tomorrow. That's the way it's going to happen. One more observation. When... He acts on you this way to keep you and to stir you up from within so that you do the self-keeping work. He is fulfilling the new covenant. Right? The new covenant. Here's one statement of the new covenant, my favorite. Jeremiah 32, 40. I will make with them, this is God talking now about the terms of the new covenant, I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. Does anybody believe that after League's sermon? It's true, the sermon was true, this is true. I will not turn away from doing good to them, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. That's the keeping of the new covenant, right? This seems crystal clear to me. The terms of the new covenant are, I have a people. I've chosen them from eternity I'm going to die for them, and I'm going to move in them with omnipotent power by my spirit. Take out the heart of stone, put in the heart of flesh, write my law on their heart, and not allow them to make shipwreck of their lives ever for all eternity. That's the terms of the new covenant. Now, here's where that shows up in the text. We know that the new covenant was bought by the blood of Jesus. So he's at the Last Supper, and he takes the cup, and he lifts it up. This cup is the new covenant in or by my blood. If this covenant, if these terms of God taking out the heart of stone and putting in the heart of flesh and writing the law in their hearts and keeping these people and never letting them depart, if that's going to come true, I've got to purchase it with my blood. And he did. It's the blood of the covenant. And when he shed his blood for his sheep, he purchased absolutely everything, including their new birth and their preservation and their glorification, which is what we offer people in the gospel. Absolutely, freely, to everyone who will believe. That's what he has achieved. So, when you read... Verse 25, that's what you should hear in the words, through Jesus Christ our Lord. To the only God, this keeping, this keeping for now, this keeping me blameless, this keeping me happy forever in the presence of a blazing glory of God, all of that action to him. Now, the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory and majesty, dominion and authority. 
So I see it working like this. How does that prepositional phrase work here? What's it modify? If you're diagramming the sentence, you don't ever do that probably. Where would you attach it? I think it's a double, it's working two ways. When the glory and the majesty and the power and the authority is moving in on my wavering heart to rescue me and keep me for another day, it's coming through Jesus' blood. There would be no reason it could come to a sinner like me if the blood of Jesus hadn't purchased it. If I were not a new covenant member and he were not fulfilling the blood-bought promise of all that power flowing to me, it's coming through Jesus Christ. And, secondly... When I am granted to awaken from the stupor of my self-pity and I see him and I ascribe to him glory and majesty and dominion and authority, I do that through Jesus Christ. I can't even come to you with thanks and praise and ascriptions of glory except through my Lord Jesus. He's my intercessor and my mediator forever. So through Jesus Christ is the gospel in this doxology. Don't underestimate the power of the gospel to keep you. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade upon your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep your life. He will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore because that has been bought for you by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, keep yourselves in the love of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we now have felt really big themes running through these nine messages. I felt myself just carried along by glorious truth. Don't think I've ever been in a conference so graced with such relentless, powerful, beautiful Bible application to your merciful keeping of your servants. Father, please apply my words and the other eight words and all the lyrics of all the songs to all the hearts in this room. I pray that prayer in the Spirit would be awakened so that pastors and all of us would plead for preserving grace every day. I pray that our hearts would rise in trust and we would build ourselves up in this holy confidence and reliance upon your promise. And I pray that if we don't see all the changes in our souls and our marriages and our churches that we want to see, that we would wait for the mercy of the Lord from heaven. And I pray that we would not miss the point that you have loved us and you have called us and those whom you have called, you will keep. Establish these friends, unshakable in this confidence, I pray. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, And to present you without any blemish before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and majesty 
and dominion and authority before all time, now, and forever and ever. Amen. Let's quietly stand.